Okay. <coughs> then uh, we continue with the summary. Um, discounting <coughs> is uh, is an important part of a cost benefit analysis, uh, and you should you should be able to do that correctly and also to to sort of justify why why you do it. Uh, net present value consists of uh, investment costs and the sum of uh, annual net benefits over a time period of uh, 25 years, 40 years. We normally use 40 years nowadays. That was actually upgraded this year from 25 to 40 years. And the R is a, is a residual value. I mean, if, if the technical lifespan of of a certain piece of infrastructure is longer than 40 years, we need to, we need to uh, use a residual value. Uh, <coughs> and it's a discussion about how to, how to determine the residual value. But if you, <coughs> if you have a, an amount of, let's say, 100 millions of investment, and you, uh, and you, uh, introduce a depreciation rate of 7%, for instance, per year, and calculate over the lifespan, the economic lifespan, which may be 25 years, 40 years, then the residual value is what you are actually left with of the investment costs after the depreci annual depreciations are, are made. <coughs> but that is not a big issue, to put it that way. The major steps <coughs> in the cost-benefit analysis is important. Um, they are important and uh, often there is a lot of mistakes that can be done uh, throughout this, uh, this process. This one is a very crucial part of the analysis to be able to identify the relevant alternatives that should be a part of an analysis. And I could, if, if I present a case to you at the exam, I could ask questions like, are there other alternatives that are left out here that should be included? And then you have to think through whether there could be other ways of solving this problem of, let's say, introducing a new, new transport link or, or whatever. Decide whose benefits and cost count. <coughs> that has to do with uh, uh, many things, but one important thing is the system border. The, the area which the project has a kind of impact. So if you, if you analyze a fjord crossing here, it's not enough to just study the impacts of the municipalities on each side of the fjord, because the, the benefits and, uh, will also be <coughs> allocated to the through traffic, which may drive all the way from Trondheim and down to Bergen, for instance. So you need to, to, to address that carefully. Who's where are the, what is the influence area of the project? Uh, and that also goes with, uh, let's say, who are uh, s perhaps suffering here from external effects? And try to identify the various stakeholders that are affected by the project. That is what is said here. Catalog the impacts. <coughs> I presented you with some impacts of this fjord, Oslo Fjord crossing. Time, visual intrusion, if, if, if that is uh, an effect. Uh, vehicle operating costs, investment costs, infrastructure operating costs, and so on. Measurement indicators, <coughs> we normally prefer monetary valuation. There is also a kind of an 
add on to the monetary valuation, which could be so-called non-priced impacts. We have not dealt too much with that during this course. So uh, we will focus here on the, on the monetized part of, of the story, which in, in cases of transportation projects are the most important ones. In, in, the, in the lion's share of the cases, the monetized impacts are the most important ones. Predict the impacts quantitatively over the life of the project using discounts, thing procedures, monetize all impacts that can be monetized, discount benefits and costs, compute the net present value, perform sensitivity analysis and make a recommendation. This is basically the steps that you might recognize from the exercise that I presented on the first sex session. Goes nicely with this, this procedure. But uh, <coughs> you can learn a lot from this point to, to make good sensitivity analysis. And, uh, and the side issue which we haven't discussed during this course, but there has been now an increasingly focus on using extreme values in the sensitivity analysis. Like, and that, uh, that, uh, that is actually sparked off by, by the IPCC report, reports that has been published over the years, and the last one that came a couple of weeks ago, stating that uh, we, have a, we, we have a global warming pr problem, and then translated into this transportation impact assessment business. What could happen to the, to the fuel price? What could happen to the oil price? What could happen to the taxation system for, uh, for uh, carbon, the carbon tax regime? So there has actually been a, a study that, is, uh, that has recently been undertaken. It's not published yet, but they have estimated how the mm, transport network models can handle a fuel price of 100 Norwegian kroner per liter. Will the models be, can they be used when you have such extreme values on, on, on one of the input variables? That is just to, let's say, be prepared if we need to to, to go to such, such extreme will the, will the analytical tools that we use cope with such uh, issues. Do you know any results of these uh, tests or is it just uh, in the end uh, yeah, the system is collapsed and now... It's, uh, it's, um, it's an interesting question. I know the results. Uh, they are not... Uh, a part of the public domain yet, uh, but um, I question the way they have done the tests, because if you if you do <coughs> such an extreme value test of one of the input variables, you should also think about if the st the state of the world comes to that we need a fuel price of that magnitude. That will also have an impact on value of time, cost calculations, and everything will be different, not only the fuel price. But you need to construct a scenario that is kind of credible, which also includes all the other effects that will be changed if you change just the fuel price. So only changing the fuel price and leaving everything else as is I would say that, uh, well, it's an interesting uh, kind of exercise, but it's not, uh, it's not at par with the reality. Because then you need to vary a lot of things if you, if you really believe in a fuel price of uh, 100 kroner per liter, then what about costs, what about value of time, what about, yeah, a lot of things. <coughs> but the system didn't collapse. 
that's uh, that's for sure. But it uh, it gave some strange results, which I think it's fully understandable. Um, Impacts for the society of uh, of, uh, of a transportation infrastructure investment was also presented. Uh, we are focusing on these types of effects. We can have um, quantified effects in physical terms, but not in economic terms. Emissions to water and soil could be elements that are or consequences that are not not monetized but you can monetize them in, indirectly in a way by saying that if you have a project with two alternatives one alternative both alternatives are let's say uh, they are profitable but it may be a kind of uh, difference that one of the projects has a net present value that are, say, 10 million higher than the other, right? 10 million higher than the other. And the only difference is connected to contamination of, uh, of, uh, of water. And the project with the, with the lowest net present value performs best in terms of uh, water contamination. So if you select the project with the lowest net present value, then you have implicitly said that the difference of 10 millions is our valuation of taking, uh, taking this water contamination issue into consideration. It's the same logic as you're asked to discuss in this, uh, this uh, exercise with the landscape is intuition case. Uh, in, the, in this small city. We also have eco effects that can be described in qualitative terms, <coughs> but where we don't have any, we don't have either physical or monetary valuation at hand. But the common denominator for all three of them is that they are real economic effects. They are not only, you need to be precise on that, that it's not redistribution we are talking about here, it's, it's net use of real resources, but they are kind of, no, uh, not all of them are quantified and monetized. Some may be just measured in fiscal terms and some in qualitative terms. Whereas the distributive effects is a pure transfer between individuals or groups in society. If you choose to improve the road network so that people will select another route, then a uh, petrol station along the old route may go bankrupt because they lose all their demand. But on the other hand, another petrol station along the new route will gain. And in economic terms, that is a distributive effect. It's not one lose, one wins. It might be of interest for the political or for the decision makers, but it's a zero sum thing. And this <coughs> here is, is this, the so called spillover effect, is a real resource effect. And I <coughs> will discuss that a bit later on when we come to the wider economic impacts, because those impacts are sort of dealing with the spillover effects, where <coughs> the economic system as a whole may become more productive if, if the size of the economic system increases. 
Then uh, Harald Gjelde, uh, he, uh, he talked about microeconomic foundations with um, where he went through uh, a set of equations and ended up with, a, with an expression of the change in social welfare <coughs> as a sum of uh, benefits and costs for all individuals, all effects. Um, the lambda here is the it's uh, it's the marginal utility of income, which we normally skip <coughs> because we assume that it is uh, equal for all individuals in an economy with a fairly well-developed political system. And that is a stretch. I know that in many countries where the distribution of income is perhaps not uh, the one that we would like to see uh, ideally. But <coughs> in most fairly well-developed market economies, we take this assumption. But it is a topic or, a, or an element of concern if we deal with, uh, let's say, projects in, developed country, in developing countries. And if you are going to compare projects, let's say, within the jurisdiction of the World Bank. Because they, they, they fund projects in, uh, in various parts of the world. But then the marginal utility of income might be an, an issue. But this is... Uh, but to, to handle that, then we approach kind of... It's complex and we sort of approach uh, the PhD level. So we have not discussed that further in this course. But the lambda could be an issue in, uh, in, uh, in some, some issues. Um, you should know the logic behind this. Uh, we start actually with this. This is a, a formal representation of actually what I showed you, this link between indifference curves, budget lines, and demand. It's a kind of the same story as this. You will not be asked to, to replicate this. I mean, it's no point because you have it in your, uh, your lecture notes. So uh, I will not give you an exercise to, or a problem to say, derive this expression based on something. I will not do that. That will be too easy. <laughs> If it had been a closed book exam, I could have done that. But um, you, should, you should know, or be able to follow the logic of this, at least. He also <coughs> presented you with, uh, with the Pareto optima uh, optimality, which is a very strong assumption. It's a state of economic affairs where no one can be better off without making at least one other person worse off. If you should apply this criterion, you couldn't do much. Because when you, when you do a transportation infrastructure investment, someone will become worse off. At least the tax, taxpayers will become worse off. So you cannot apply this. You can apply this one. The project is profitable as long as the winners can compensate the losers and still be better off. That is actually what is said in the, in the cost-benefit analysis. As long as the benefits outweigh the costs, then the project is profitable. But it is not necessarily so that you have to compensate the losers of the project. But you should be able to do it in terms of letting the benefits outweigh the costs. Then <coughs> we went on to valuing uh, costs and benefits and, uh, and uh, tried to say a bit about demand modeling. Uh, because this is, this is important when we, when we do cost-benefit analysis in practice. To be able to say something sensible about 
the development and demand. Uh, because uh, demand is what, say, causes benefits to occur. And I, as you saw in the, in the exercise that I presented to you, demand can be expressed in terms of uh, annual growth per year, growth per year. And it can also be <coughs> of interest to see what is the shift in demand if you, if you do a significant improvement in the transport infrastructure network. Then you can have a jump in traffic, as was indicated in the table in the, in the exercise, where the ferry had an annual average daily traffic of 5,000, whereas the bridge had 7,000. It's a jump of 2,000. And to identify that jump, and to um, identify the annual growth after the jump has taken place, if any jump takes place, is important here. But this is not a course in forecasting, <coughs> but I just want you to, to be aware of, uh, of some of the logics. We can express demand as a function of prices of transport, prices of substitutes and complements, from P2 to Pn, and then you may have number of workplaces, GDP growth, population growth, car ownership, gender, because males and females have different travel patterns. Females are much more, uh, let's say, dependent upon their time budget than men. Do you know why? Maybe the time schedule of kindergarten, school, and everything. Maybe yes, <coughs> the, there is a certain division of labor between men and women in the society, which materializes in uh, in things like that. So, uh, <coughs> so it is so actually, if you consider introducing a road pricing scheme. The gender variable may take effect in terms of uh, giving different price elasticities between men and women because of this time constraint. It's interesting. <coughs> to study tra travel behavior is interesting, but uh, it's not, again, a part of this course. It's a lot of. And trips, <coughs> types of trips, could neutralize the gender effect to some, some respect, because, because um, women do more combined trips than men, especially in the morning, for some reason. But you see, this is a demand model, an example. There are other variables that could be included as well. The methods, <coughs> quantitative and qualitative methods, uh, Time series production pro projections is uh, is uh, is one. Um, regression analysis and various types, which we which was presented at uh, at this lecture, and also um, there is also there are also qualitative methods around which can be actually of, uh, of use if you are going to, let's say, penetrate new markets, which is perhaps more of, a, of, a, of an issue in, uh, let's say, air transport, and not perhaps that much in road transport. But for air transport, you often try to, to penetrate new markets and you don't know too much about the demand. And then you need to, to gather some qualitative expert advice. Whereas in the road sector, you, you know much more about, about the market. This is again just to take this demand model uh, as a step further, a slightly more simplified one, which can be converted into a casual model by, um, by uh, applying what we can what we call a Cobb-Douglas function. 
And if we take the logs of a Cobb-Douglas function, we get something like this, <coughs> which can be used in a, in, a, in a regression analysis when we, when we collect time series data. And the nice properties of this is that the A, B, C, D, the coefficients, are elasticities. So, uh, in this case, C is the elasticity of income, B is the elast cross price elasticity related to other goods, A is the direct price elasticity, and D is an elasticity connected to increase in population. And if you then know from, uh, let's say, forecasts made by the National Bureau of Statistics, that the population is expected to increase with a certain percentage per year. And if you then have the elasticity with respect to demand for, let's say, car movements on a given road stretch, you have a very valuable piece of information for being able to forecast the development in traffic. And the same with GMP. GMP and population is, of course, in a way, correlated. But not, perhaps not so strong that you can just use one of them. Because if, you, if, they, are very strongly, if they are very strongly correlated, then you use just one of them in the, in the regression analysis. Then you have a multicollinearity problem if you, if you have a very strong correlation. Then, <coughs> after the transport modeling, we went on with uh, market imperfections, which is very common in the transport sector. And to give an overview of market imperfections and their impacts, and how you should deal with them in a cost-benefit analysis is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is relevant, is a relevant output from this course. Here, one market imperfection is, uh, is imperfect competition. Another is when <coughs> translated to the transport sector, if you have this increasing returns to scale, meaning that the average costs are decreasing with output, it's a normal road stretch without congestion. Has this cost profile. An airport without congestion, likewise. Train service, coastal service, has this. So, <coughs> so in this case, um, a price According to the marginal cost, like this, an optimal price in terms of uh, the optimal price criterion is that the uh, price should be set equal to the marginal cost of providing a, a good or service. If you do that here, you run with a deficit equal to this shaded gray area. Uh, so <coughs> in many cases, you, you need to to charge a price according to this level, PA, because at this level you cover the average costs, including the capital costs. And uh, <coughs> this gives a slight reduction in demand. And cost-benefit analysis the assumption that we make in a cost-benefit analysis is that we have a competitive market where the cost structure is, uh, is different from this. But I have, I have looked into the importance of this type of market imperfection and because we are calculating the effects of differences between situations, a ferry, a fixed link, an airport with or without improvements, the difference <coughs> will not be very much affected by this type of, of market failure. 
so we can live with a situation where we where we have prices equal to to some average cost as long as we we consider the differences in in uh, let's say an alternative compared to a base case gives a very very modest bias <coughs> even if we have this kind of, of imperfection. Hmm? Yeah, this is um, definitions of, uh, of uh, external effects. Um, this is not the same as I showed you uh, on the previous slide, which has to do with the, the, the cost structure. This is uh, about imposing types of effects on others without taking those effects into consideration in their own production or utility function. To put it in, uh, in, uh, <coughs> in common language, what is said here is that if you are going to use your car to work in the morning, you know there is a, the, the, the traffic will, uh, will queue up on your way to, to work, but you don't care, you do it anyway, because you, <coughs> you think it's okay to, to get rid of uh, spouses and kids and uh, everything and just sit there and listen to the radio and read the newspaper and everything while they're standing in line. It's a, it's a good, good part of the day to sta stand in a queue for half an hour to get to work, right? That could be a situation. But what you forget is that by doing that, <coughs> you also impose delays for all the other users. Because in a congested network, if one extra unit enters the network, the average speed will slow down. I mean, so everybody else has the same preference. It may not matter too much, but, but you, you, you get my point, right? So, <coughs> so you need, to, you need to, to take that into consideration. And uh, <coughs> this, is, uh, this is how it works in practice. Because here we don't have this decreasing returns to scale or this diminishing average cost curve anymore. It increases. Because here you have, you have increasing costs with demand because of this congestion problem. So <coughs> here you, you have um, a private equilibrium. This is what this curve is what you pay to get to work. And this is the social marginal cost curve, which, is, uh, which gives higher costs because you are imposing a slightly slowed travel speed for everybody else and some other costs as well. So the difference between the private and the social costs here will be the difference between that point and this point. But to, able to, to be able to construct a market equilibrium here, you need to impose a, a, a road toll, which is equal to this distance. But the external effect of uh, being allocated here at the private equilibrium is this distance between the social and the private marginal cost curve. So road tolls is a way of <coughs> internalizing the external effects. And then you can include them in the cost-benefit analysis directly. But if you don't do that, you need to include the congestion costs in your calculations. And, uh, and many cost-benefit analysis handbooks uh, do that. They have uh, procedures for including the external effects because in mo most cases we don't have road pricing. Some cities have, but not many. London has, and a few other cities. 
Even New York has a kind of, kind of road pricing scheme. Yeah. This is a hard deal specialty. Environmental costs. <coughs> um, there is a, the, there are of course uh, challenges connected to monetize the 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 impacts connected to air emissions and noise. Um, we are doing such uh, such monetize, monetization of of effects in various ways. Willingness to pay studies has been uh, has been discussed a bit with uh, contingent valuation methods, travel cost methods, and so on. And I know that some of you are writing essays about that as well. <coughs> Estimated damage costs, which is, uh, let's say, I talked about water contamination, and you could, if if you are uh, sort of lucky and you have the data. You can calculate the, the costs of contamination. Uh, I mean, if you contaminate a, a source for uh, drinking water, you could you could <coughs> calculate the costs of uh, of amending that pollution, uh, or at worst, the cost of finding another source of drinking water, which could be. <coughs> estimates of damage costs and the political shadow prices is the ones that I'm the example that I mentioned to you the difference in profit profits uh, or uh, in net present value of 10 millions you choose the project with the lowest net present value because it scores better on let's say water contamination and then you have a kind of a political shadow price because if that decision is made the implicit value of that water resource is then 10 millions. Or not the implicit value of the resource, but the change in quality that will be imposed on that resource if we choose <coughs> the, the, the project with which contaminates it in a way. Optimal emission levels are not always zero. Here we have uh, we have um, marginal cost of reducing emissions. Here we have the marginal benefits of reducing emissions. If the costs exceeds the benefits, uh, we can or for to to reach this point we can impose a tax which is this of this magnitude if the costs of reducing the external costs are below the tax level you will actually use no, you will not pay the tax but you will use some kind of uh, technical device to reduce emissions but if the costs are of reducing emissions are above the tax level, you will pay the tax. And by paying the tax, given, you have, given that you have a, a certain demand elasticity for, uh, say, consuming the good that causes the emissions, you will reduce emissions down to this, this optimum level of emissions. And this is uh, this is a kind of a dynamic thing because um, when IPCC comes uh, launches reports on on global warming, mm -hmm. the marginal benefits of uh, of reducing emissions may shift; they may increase. Um, so 
so that uh, that this thing may be affected by uh, by uh, by also uh, let's say an increase if you get better information about the uh, effects of emissions and so on this can shift but it is a mechanism to to determine the optimal point <coughs> and the tax connected to to that accident costs Some of you are writing about this, about the value of statistical life, about uh, quality adjusted life years and so on. I will not go into to details on that, but, but there is an important topic in cost-benefit analysis to, to consider the changes in accident costs. This is also controversial. Because some researchers, they say that the external effects of accidents are embedded in the decisions that you make. So, to put it in another way, if you choose a more dangerous route, given that you have the information about the danger of choosing one route above another, or choosing one transport mode above another, you have internalized, you have actually revealed, or you may have actually a preference for exposing yourself to slightly more danger, just to have fun. To trade fun up against an increased probability of uh, getting injured. I drive a motorcycle, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've done that for, uh, I still, I'm still around, I've done it since mid, mid 90s or something. But, uh, but it's not ideal. But then <coughs> you could argue that, well, uh, <laughs> I have then internalized my, that's part of my, my, uh, my utility function. When I select to go on the motorbike, and if I crash, There might be some external effects connected to, to, uh, to system effects and things like that, but uh, external effects connected to risk for me as an individual is likely to be zero. Because that's a part of my, that's what I want to do. Whereas others, but if I have the same preference for driving with a vehicle like this. We, if I'm a risk taker and driving one of these types of vehicles, then you can talk about real external effects for, for all the others on the road. I mean, if you crash with a motorcycle, you are not likely to hurt, at least not many else, but if you crash with one of these, you could easily do. So this is a, a complex discussion, and I don't expect you to to take that, but just to mention that this accident cost issue is actually a, a topic which is researched quite quite heavily, uh, and some of you have uh, have discussed it also in your essays. Time costs. Just to end with that. Uh, and this session with that. Uh, I've talked about um, the difference between social and private marginal cost curve, um, where congestion, slow speed, not only for you, but also for everybody else. So in a congestion, uh, uncongested network, the external time costs are zero. But if you get situations like this, they are, uh, they, they could be, they are rather si significant. And they are also significant because such delays are often not taking, taken into your, into consideration when you plan your journey. So that the inconveniences, 
And then I'm not talking about those who are uh, reading newspapers and things and drinking coffee, but I'm talking about, let's say, public transport users, uh, heavy goods vehicles, and people that do not have time for for reading newspapers and drinking coffee uh, to that extent, they suffer. And that's why we we add a coefficient of a significant magnitude to, to calculate the value of time in, uh, in congested networks. So one thing that I could ask you about is to say that, well, the, time, the value of time in an uncongested road is 200 kroner per hour, or I can convert it into euros if you like. The value of time in a congested network is 600. And I could ask, please discuss why this difference is so large, something like that. Then you have to think and use some theory to, to justify why this difference is so, so large. Okay, then we break.